The dance of the Mamutones is a link with Sardinia's archaic beginnings. Both the ritual and the use of this kind of mask date back to prehistoric times, to the days of the first hunters. One of the Mediterranean's oldest cultural roots. In many parts of the Mediterranean, towering city walls are a somber legacy of wars and skirmishes. The enemy was always from a neighboring region. But it is not unusual to find evidence of hospitable intentions at the gates of these same walls. Guests are sacred for me. My home, my food are yours, stranger from a distant port. In this ongoing contrast between tranquility and violence, between the present and the past, where does the Mediterranean's true identity lie? Setting out in search of the Mediterranean, in the words of Ferdinand Brodel, the world's greatest authority on Mediterranean civilizations, means moving into a Unitarian world, across a characteristic, unmistakable landscape that is capable, without warning, of breaking up into a series of different geographical locations and natural environments. setting out in search of many different civilizations that have blended into each other in the course of thousands of years of history. It means, for example, finding ancient Roman ruins in Africa, like these in Leptis Magna in Libya. It means coming across prehistoric sites, like this one in Corsica. It means being pleasantly surprised to discover oneself in the Orient. And yet, the port of Istanbul is very much a Mediterranean reality, in spite of its exotic appearance. In other words, setting out in search of the Mediterranean means losing oneself in an ever-changing world full of contrast between today and the vestiges of yesterday. One exciting encounter after another with historical events that too often have been imbued with infamy. Today, in Mediterranean waters once sailed by Ulysses, sailboats beguiled tourists intent on shutting out the reality of our times. A reality revealed in this case by satellite reconnaissance. This electronic picture taken from space reveals a large oil spill in the Aegean Sea caused by a Greek tanker. One of the many polluting slicks that are poisoning the Mediterranean. Marseille, Livorno, Piraeus, Tunis, Naples, Toulouse, Barcelona, Genoa.
modern port cities that have developed on sites where some 800 years before Christ, Phoenician shipping used to dock, long before the days of Roman galleys. Uncontrolled urban planning has left garish, often disturbing contrasts in its wake. For example, waste from refineries located inland from Venice is causing the gangrene that is eating away the marble ornamentation of this model city and polluting its lagoon. Setting out in search of the Mediterranean means, for Brodel, encroaching on insular worlds closed within themselves. Or casting off from the keys of maritime cities that have survived the past and are still terminals for shipping from all over the world. Let us not forget that Mediterranean ships have been plying all the seas of our planet for the past 400 years. Finally, let's not forget that on the shores of the Mediterranean meet Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so it is interesting to compare local traditions. Dances, like this one in Smyrna, in Turkey, like this one in Provence, in France. And like this one in Jalala, in Tunisia, remind us that races on three continents live side by side on the shores of the same sea. is the conclusion that when we consider the immense cultural heritage of the different worlds that meet here, we realize that the Mediterranean is the best witness of its own past. Contrasts are everywhere, like the presence of Christian castles in Islamic countries. This one is in Bodrum in Turkey. And Arab castles on Christian territory. In particular, in Spain, where this bridge in Granada, built by the Romans, has served the armies of the Moors, the cavalry of the Reconquistadores, and Jews and Moriscos fleeing for their lives. City walls, towers, castles, and other fortifications held secrets, art treasures, and immense wealth, sometimes to protect selfish interests sometimes to safeguard an invaluable national heritage. Other examples include Venetian castles in Dalmatia, like this one in Cursola. Spanish castles built around the coast of Sicily by Charles V. This one is in Augusta. Habsburg's Castle Country House Imperial Palace Complex in Trieste. Castel del Monte in Italy's Puglia region. The architectural masterpiece of a German king deep in sun-baked southern Italy. From north to south, we find contrast after contrast in countless layers of history. Further examples are the result not of military domination or urban development, but of the clash between spiritual legacies and an equally composite web of religious roots. This Christian church on the Palatine Hill in Rome is built on the ruins of a pagan temple. In Seville, a minaret, the traditional symbol of Islam, is now the bell tower of the Christian cathedral. And it was here, in Seville, that in the year 1000, a Jewish synagogue became a Christian church. Later, it was turned into a mosque during the five centuries of Arab domination, before being finally returned to Christianity. It 
its composite style is the result of clashes between the monotheistic religions that developed on the shores of the Mediterranean. When, despite their common roots, Christians, Jews, and Muslims began fighting, as they are still fighting today, to destroy each other. Crowds of people who believe in the same God, albeit through different teachings, will suddenly attack each other. Tolerance is forsaken in favor of ferocious, pointless killing. Once again, the past intrudes on the present. Muslims fighting Jews, Jews fighting Muslims, Christians fighting Christians, and even Muslims fighting Muslims. Nobody is innocent. Western civilizations on the shores of the Mediterranean created great masterpieces. Many of these works have survived to the present day. Some were swallowed up by the waves and lay for centuries on the sea floor before they were recovered and ended up in museums around the world. And yet, when looking at works like these, another example is the magnificent Laocoon, it is difficult to understand how the same Mediterranean artisans who made such beautifully harmonious creations could be equally adept at making horrifying instruments of death. Just as it is difficult to understand how highly civilized nations have been able to introduce inhuman legislation such as the laws that led to the extermination of millions in the concentration camps of totalitarian regimes. And so, the Mediterranean is not only a workshop for great artists and artisans, but also a simmering crucible of violence. And yet, in the course of this century, it has become one of the world's most popular vacation spots. Ancient Mediterranean gods have become the symbols of a Mediterranean without national boundaries, invaded no longer by armies of legionnaires, but by peaceful hordes of tourists. Every summer, some 200 million vacationers descend on Mediterranean countries from Spain to Turkey. The gods are no longer portrayed in marble, but in plastic to decorate temples built in honor of a faith which is worshipped uninterruptedly during the summer nights. of another contrast between the Mediterranean of today and that of yesterday. A contrast between invaders in armor and chain mail and today's scantily clad armies. Or between the castles in brick and marble of bygone times and those built for fun on resort beaches. Once a year, on one of these beaches, fiery steeds and their colorful riders take the place of the usual army of tourists.
The venue is one of the world's most famous tourist beaches on the shores of Provence in the south of France. Around this castle church, the ritual of holiday fun-making gives way to an ancient, more profound event in which one of the world's smallest races celebrates the day of its saint, Sainte Marie de la Mer, godmother of the Mediterranean's last remaining gypsy communities. Gypsies, people who are out of the ordinary. And too often on these shores, Spain in this case, such people have been and continue to be shunned and persecuted. A collective rejection that often assumes ritualistic proportions. In the sleepy village of Gredas, life is uneventful all year round except for one day in February, El Dia del Peropalo. A curious word, Peropalo, which stands for stranger. On Stranger's Day, Gredas is free to vent its aggression on the symbolic outsider. The whole village takes part in the pageant reenacting his capture, together with his poor donkey. Outwardly a festive occasion, Stranger's Day in Gredas is symbolic of the strong wielding their power over the weak. The event reaches its climax in the trial of the stranger and in the death sentence he receives. A sentence that reminds us of hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands of similar sentences, all emblematic of the persecution that has always afflicted minority groups. Another dramatic confrontation on which the Mediterranean's very existence depends is found at the ecological level. It is no secret that pollutants of every kind are threatening the future of this sea, rightfully considered one of the world's most beautiful stretches of water. But the Mediterranean is as strong as it is beautiful. This is the only explanation for its ability to withstand the sickening pollution that is eroding the purity of its once crystal clear waters. Here we see the killers of the Mediterranean caught on film. Rivers that every hour of the day and night pour tons of poison into its waters. But this is not where the real problem lies. The scandalous truth is that although the rich, industrialized Mediterranean nations know the problem exists and that it is technically possible to solve it by treating the water before it reaches the sea, they are doing little or nothing in that direction. Today, it can safely be said that we know not only who the killers are, but also who is behind them. It's important to add that all those who pollute and poison the environment, here, a waste pipe spews red mud into the Tyrrhenian Sea, harm the Mediterranean twice over, upsetting with acts of pure vandalism both the ecological balance and the ancient harmony that exists between man and the sea.
chemical industries that produce fertilizers to raise the productivity of arable lands certainly help to increase grain yields. But at the same time, they are contributing to the pollution of other areas, underwater areas. The domain of the Posidonia grass that guarantees the survival of these waters. Through photosynthesis, activated by the sun's rays, every square meter of vegetation produces 10 liters of oxygen. In recent years, hydrobiologists have been studying the diseases affecting these sea lungs. Following their suggestions, thousands and thousands of plants have been transplanted in the shallow coastal waters of Italy, France, and Spain, where Posidonia grass had disappeared. At this moment, hydrobiology and other sea-related scientific disciplines are the weapons being used in the great battle to save the Mediterranean. of this scenario is a study of the so-called mucilage phenomenon, which seems to fade away in some areas and spread in others. underwater laboratories have been set up in several areas of the Mediterranean to perfect the creation of artificial barriers onto which are grafted millions of mussels. Mussels are particularly fond of the floating, often polluting mucilage. And in this way, an artificial but highly useful food chain has been created that will contribute to the repopulation of vast underwater areas. It is also certain that this kind of hydroculture will soon make the barbarous practice of trawl fishing for swordfish obsolete by using advanced technology to create vast food reserves. Finally, it will be possible to make a comparison between past and present in this field too. To cite one of many examples, Hydroculture systems were first used by the early inhabitants of the Venetian lagoon. The locks and barriers they created restricted their catch to fish above a certain size and let smaller ones get away to grow bigger and reproduce. last leg of our journey through the Mediterranean. Here, comparisons can be more dramatic and even more emblematic than elsewhere. Because of its splendors, Venice was once known as the Queen of Mediterranean Cities, a title honored in the annual historical regatta, which every year caters less to history and more to the tourists. Today, Venice is in decline and seems to nurture a death wish. In fact, all the problems of the Mediterranean, from pollution to culture-related degradation, seem even bigger here. But a comparison with the past does not necessarily have to sow pessimism. Whenever it has been caught in a crisis situation like today, Venice has always risen above its problems. Can we expect a similar reaction throughout the Mediterranean? The answer may well be yes, if there is a universal commitment to preserve the sea's cultural identity and what remains of the harmony that exists between man's works and the environment. In other words, Everything that for 4,000 years has enabled a highly evolved civilization to spread out from here. And that our generation must not allow to be degraded, uprooted, and destroyed.
The comparison that can be made between a heritage, magnificent or humble as it may be, that must be saved, and the destruction that must be stopped, leaves no room for discussion. No further compromises can be made between positive and negative action.